Before the actual reconstruction of the face or a skull can start, we must do a comprehensive and thorough description and measurement of the skull itself. In order to measure correctly, we need to make certain marks. First, we draw the sagittal bone on the skull. This is the line of the plane which divides the skull into the right and left halves. Here on the temporal lines in the spot of the maximum convergence, the frontotemporal points are located. The attachment of the chewing muscles is also marked. Here is a barely profiled line. It shows us the spot where the musculus temporalis is attached. On the lower jaw there's the locations of musculus masseter, the chewing muscle itself. For the nose with the approximation, we use the points called alare in Latin, which are the spots of the canine alveolar yolks. Here, against the canine, we draw vertical lines and a horizontal line. These intersections help figure out the width of the nose. Now we'll make some measurements similar to human cranial measurements on this skull. The maximum cranial length is 154 mm. The maximum cranial breadth is 106 mm. The maximum cranial height is 98 mm. The morphological facial height is 111 mm. The facial breadth at eye level is 89 mm while the nasal height is 53 mm. The nasal breadth, that's where these alari points come in handy, is 34 mm. The upper jaw height is an important feature in this case, though it's only 15 mm. Left orbital breadth, 34 mm. Right orbital breadth, 33 mm. At this stage, we have completed the measurements of Homo naledi, and based on these dimensions, we will try to calculate the dimensions in vivo. We will be using the dimensions based on the studies of modern human population. But having chimpanzee skulls and head casts in our collection will also help. We'll be using special sculptural plasticine. It's firm, so first you've got to soften it. And before we begin to impose plasticine muscles, we'll have to add a few missing parts. First, the zygomatic arches. Now we have a rough estimation of the cheekbones. In order to accurately restore the chewing muscles, we should model the lower jaw. And now we'll proceed to actual formation of the chewing muscles. First, some rough shaping. What's essential here is keeping within the boundaries where this muscle ends. Now forming the chewing muscles. The zygomatic arch wasn't lost, we can see it here, we can trace it. We have completed this stage of the muscle reconstruction. Now we can see the musculus temporalis, musculus masseter, on one side. The other side helps us to verify our accuracy. Next we'll try to shape the soft tissue helmet on the cranial vault and the entire back surface of the brain case. And again, first we'll model only half the face, while the other half will serve as a reference. We'll then compare both to verify how correctly we've applied the tissue. The soft tissue depth on the vault is approximately 5 mm, with some thickening up to about 6 to 7 mm in the occiput. I'm measuring the thickness with the sliding caliper and then place the strip of the right size along the sagittal line on the skull. So, in the occiput area the thickness is about 7 mm. The vault is covered with the tissue about 5 mm thick. 
and on the glabella, I'm adding some volume with soft plasticine. Now we have to cover the entire right side with plasticine of equal depth. Now I'm taking a strip of the right thickness and I'll apply it along the perimeter of the orbit. We'll form the eyeball afterwards. It should have a diameter allowing it to fit into these frames of epithelial tissue. The tissue is less steep on the nasal bones. And this is typical for both modern humans and chimpanzees. On this particular skull, the front parts of the cheekbones were absent. But according to anatomy, we also observe some thickening of the tissue here. It may be about 7 or 8 millimeters. On the lateral surface of zygomatic bones, the depth decreases again, it's about 5 millimeters too. And we're putting this mark on the zygomatic arch. The transition here will be pretty smooth, and the tissue depth on the lateral surface of the zygomatic bone will be about 7 millimeters. According to the tables of tissue depth distribution, it is 7 to 8 millimeters at the base of the nose. If we look at the skull profile from a side, we can also see the tissue thickening in the area of lip protrusion. Now we can say that this skull presents the basic labels, marking the tissue depth in its different regions. Here we can already see the marks of soft tissue depth placed on the skull in certain parts of the face. Here on the sagittal plane, the distribution of tissue thickness is clearly visible. Next up, we'll do smooth filling of voids between these columns and marks, taking into account the morphology of underlying skull structures. Our next step will be imposing crests of plasticine over the entire helmet of the half of the brain case. And the boundaries between them are smoothed out with a modeling tool. trying to retain the shape peculiar to this particular skull. We'll be using this tool to keep things accurate. It's basically a needle, which allows us to verify if we've correctly applied the tissue depth. This part of the upper jaw, the tissue depth should be about 7 mm. Here it's 7 to 8 millimeters. In the upper lip area it should be a bit deeper, about 9 millimeters. Then we'll be filling the voids between the plasticine crests, measuring the tissue depth as we go. Now I'm taking a piece of plasticine to reconstruct the nasal region. We'll fill that in the nasal aperture. We'll also apply only half of it to the sagittal line. Then we'll profile the nasal cartilages. Shaping the nose is pretty complicated, because we can't be sure how the soft tissues were actually distributed. The skull has some anatomic limitations for the nose width. And these are the canine alveolar yolks. We have drawn these lines marking the canine alveolar yolks, and anatomically, the nose should not extend beyond this structure. This is what the profile of the nasal dorsum will look like on our reconstruction. Thus, we've come to the stage when we have half the face already. We can estimate the depth of the soft tissue along the sagittal line and we can verify if we have traced it correctly in different regions of the head. The upper jaw protrudes a little forward. That means a good deal of prognathism, 
to the extent we can see in modern humans as well. The nose slightly protrudes in this cartilaginous part, more than in Australopithecines. The average diameter of the human eyeball is 24 millimeters. For chimpanzees, it's about 20 millimeters. Our specimens' height and size are close to those of a chimp. The depth of the eyeball setting within the orbit is such that it should protrude by about 2 millimeters from the soft tissue surrounding the eye. Now, if we look closely at the chimp's face from the side, we can see the eyeball protruding by about 2 millimeters. The same value is stated by ophthalmologists in studies of the eyeball depth in humans. So we'll stick to the same value. Well, the approximate protrusion from the soft tissues is just a few millimeters. The eyelid thickness is 2 to 3 millimeters. The eyelid is actually thinner in humans than in chimpanzees. So here we will not reduce it and we'll make it 3 millimeters. Now let's tackle the palpebral fissure itself. In humans it's elongated. In animals it's certainly not quite so rounded as in owls, but it's still closer to a rounded shape than in humans. And most likely, early homos generally had shorter eyes. Probably at this stage we can stop, although the eye still awaits some thorough refinement. What did early humans' ears look like? If we look at this reconstruction of Plesianthropus by Mikhail Gerasimov, it's not clear why Gerasimov went for this size of the oracle. Because in modern humans this parameter is 5 to 6 centimeters. The chimpanzee's ears are much larger. In this case it's 8 centimeters. Here we can see the place where the external ear canal comes out. The cartilaginous structure is opposite to it, the so-called tragus of the ear. I've measured 5 cm with a slight shift upward, because the upper part of the oracle is larger, and I'm outlining the ear. First, we're going to make a rough shape, and then we'll mold it in accordance with the actual shape. According to Gerasimov, the position of the ear and its orientation coincides with the direction of the ramus of the mandible. So this is how the outer part of the ear will be orientated. Here we have roughly shaped the oracle, based on the standards for modern humans and their closest relatives, the chimpanzees. Now, one half of the head is roughly finished. Further work will include reproducing the left part of the head by the same method we've already demonstrated in this video, and shaping the neck, the lower part of the lower jaw, and the rest of the body. Basically, we've got to refine some details now. All the features have got to be harmonious, so we need to remove asymmetrical shapes, which could distort the skull. Next, we need to make the head look nicer, looking from a side. In the upper corners of the mouth, the upper lip thins down to nothing. And the lower lip comes to its minimum here too. 
This inverted mucous membrane is almost invisible here in the corners. Well, in general, our work is complete. We've got such a tiny guy here. It's not without reason that most researchers tend to attribute it to the genus Homo. The reconstruction is pretty much finished now. Now, we have here the skull of Homo naledi, completely reconstructed according to Lee Berger. This is a 3D model in 3D space. It's already visualized in a more or less final version. Based on this skull, we've reconstructed the hominid itself. This is the result. It's placed in a generic landscape. This is a sketch of its general appearance that will be used in the final video. Do you think it's accurate? Can you please point out to errors, if any? Because we work mostly as animation artists. You've done a great job, Sergey. Your model gives a very good idea of the creature's looks. I'd only recommend that you correct some minor details. As for the nose, I would suggest to make it more similar to our reconstruction. You should add a bit more projection to the nasal bones. while the tip of the nose should be somewhat lower to match the anatomical structure. Here the boundary of the musculus masseter, or the chewing muscle, is set too far back. You need to add just a little bit of tissue here. The mouth is perfect. Now for the eye region. Well, there's just a little lack of soft tissue here. As for the ears, maybe they're a little too vertical. Maybe you should project it a little bit back, according to the ramus line of the mandible. And I guess they might look a bit too human. So maybe you should show this upper part as more developed. Similar to chimpanzees. And the ear should be a little bit smaller. I think 6 centimeters would be just the right size. Stanislav, this is the visual we've got so far. This should add a bit more drama to it. But if you see any drawbacks, please tell us. This is the skeleton, it'll be assembled like this. This is a draft version of the visual. Well, this radius bone is turned backwards. I mean, this is its top, it should be rotated. But other details seem to be all right. Like all ancient humans, they had a pretty wide pelvis and belly. Most likely, they were mainly plant eaters, so the intestines had to be large, hence the large belly. Let's look at the high poly model now. Here we also make the corrections we've discussed with Elisaveta. She did like the prognathism, so she's approved it. We'll just add some mass down here and orient the skull more dorsally. Well, here is the spine. It goes like this, and the foramen magnum is here. We have the skull, here is the foramen magnum. The cervical lower dorsis seems to be way too big. It should be more vertical. In fact, all these ancient guys were just fine with their arms, so their entire shoulder girdle had to be massive. The hand is almost human, but not quite so. If we compare it to human bones, I have it inside myself, human phalanges are straight, and these ones are very curved. I mean, these are not half-bent fingers here, these are fully stretched. And he could not make his fingers any straighter inherently. And this is a terrible curvature. So this structure as a whole suggests straight climbing. In fact, apart from being very small, the foot is basically human. I mean, the naledi certainly has some specific tailor's bone, but it has just a couple of features that are slightly different. 
This is easily explained by allometry. And in general, this food is a regular human food. In fact, the anatomy of the naledi is sort of mosaic, a mix of very primitive and very progressive features. And afterwards, please measure his food. We will compare every proportion, of course. Here we have a 3D model of a leopard. It's already got a deformable skeleton for animation. It would be great to make its tail a bit less rat-like. The leopard's tail begins as the extension of the spine, then curves sharply down and bends at the end. Not that it must be exactly like that. This is done mostly for animation. This is the so-called default pose. That is the average pose that helps us to design the skeleton to make further animation. And maybe you should make its legs a little shorter. I'm no great expert in leopards, but a jaguar's or a leopard's shoulder girdle is somewhat lower than its butt, and its back is slightly sagged. Here it is a bit too brutal, more like some saber-toothed tiger. But maybe the reason is that its front paws are too straight. If we bent them, the front paw would be lower, the back would arch and the butt would be more rounded and taller. I see. We'll check the proportions of the anatomy and refine our model. This is a skull that was recently found in the nearby Lesedi chamber. The good news is, it has a nose that was absent from the earlier skull. I mean, the first skull found in the Dina Lady chamber had a beautiful brain case as well as the upper and lower jaws, but the middle part of its face was sadly missing. And after a little more excavation, they found it. By the way, it was a rather long time ago, but they took time to publish it. Scientists always conceal, as everyone knows. But they've published it at last, and its brain case is connected to its facial part. We shall ask Elisaveta what she meant, because it's hard for me to say that just for sure. But she said about these arms, that in her opinion they are connected with the shift here. This is obvious, because we can see the nasal bones here, and they should be vertical, but they stand at an angle. I mean, here are two nasal bones, and they go in some incomprehensible direction. Of course, it would be great to take a look at the original. What do you think about the pose Anatoly suggests? Could the owner of this skeleton assume this posture? Is the posture typical for this creature? I really want this full-size reconstruction to reflect its specific features. Its skeleton structure allowed it to stand this way or another, as well as to swing in a tree. We'll get a better idea about this creature's postures when they publish all the skeletons found. Though in fact this specific pose can hardly be reconstructed from a skeleton, but I don't see why it couldn't stand like this. We decided not to put any tools in his hands. That's right, because none have been found so far. Though I think they probably did use something, but as we know nothing about it, it's better that way. In fact, we can be 100% sure they did roam without tools in some cases, and we have no idea if they used tools at all. The hair would be the final stage of this project, and we didn't even start to talk about it. I don't think it should be much different from human. This is 2 meters high, while he is 150. Yes, it stands about 1 meter 46 centimeters, or just under 4.8 feet tall, as Sergei's grid shows. Would it be easy to cast if there were no soft tissues but these marker strips? Will you be able to cast a mold if those were plasticine strips? Then we could make more. Well, then we will go on, and thank you very much. We're looking at the face of an individual who lived hundreds of thousands of years ago in South Africa. Most scientists agree that this is a direct descendant of Australopithecus africanus, 
Through Australopithecus sediba to Homo naledi. Let's look at its progressive features. We see much less pronounced eyebrow ridges of Homo naledi, but they have heavy tori conjoining in the middle. These are not the eyebrow ridges yet, but still some kind of cap over the eyes. As for the cranial vault, it's pretty high. As we can see here, chimp frontal bone normally has elevation, but it's pretty narrow. Here the retroorbital narrowing is small, and the brain case has generally a pretty modern look. As for the jaws, a dramatic decrease in prognathism is visible, that is, forward projection of the jaw region. Unfortunately, on this particular skull, the middle part of the face was absent. But other findings from the same cave system have allowed us to make some estimation the development of its nasal bones. There's a lack of protrusion of the nasal bones in chimpanzees and generally no great apes. We should also say a few words about the development of chewing muscles. In general, the chewing apparatus is rather moderately developed, I should say. Apparently, their nutrition was already varied, and probably it was mostly fruit. These are the temporal lines, they're quite far apart. If we recall the skull of Paranthropus or the robust Australopithecine, its temporal lines are very tall, and they even converge on the sagittal line forming a sagittal crest on the skull, which served for the attachment of powerful chewing muscles that were necessary for chewing rough food. Here we can clearly see that its nutrition was quite different. The face is perhaps pretty broad in its proportions, fairly large and very orthognatic that is, lacking of significant profiling in the jaw region.